You all both work here? No, Okay. Community College. Connecticut College, okay. Everyone. Welcome. My name is Pam Franks, and I'm the Deputy Director and Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Yale University Art Gallery, and I am delighted, delighted to see you all here today. Thank you so much for coming. I just am here for one minute to say welcome and so happy to be collaborating with ArtSpace on this important program, and I want to thank Helen Cowder and Sarah Fritchley for reaching out and forging this partnership. It's really important to us, as I know it is. Um, to you. It's been a terrific summer and this is a great culmination. I also just want to say that one of the most important things that we share with ArtSpace is our deep commitment to working with living artists. And um, in that light, I want to say that Titus Kafar, the artist who is a driving force behind this entire endeavor, has been one of the gallery's main collaborators for over a decade now, since he first arrived at the Yale School of Art in 2004 and it's a real kind of uh, joy to see this all coming together with all of our efforts together. Um, tomorrow we will have a chance to get into the galleries with a number of gallery educators and curators um, and I invite you to come back and back. We're always free and open to the public so I hope we'll see you here often and with that I just want to turn it over to Helen who's going to introduce the conference. Thank you, Pam. I am Helen Cowder, the director of ArtSpace, and I thank you all for coming and taking part <coughs> in this two-day conversation. It's really a tremendous privilege for ArtSpace, for me and for ArtSpace, um, to be here welcoming all of you, and I want to thank Pam and Jock Reynolds and all the UAG staff who worked on putting this program together. ArtSpace has always believed that artists have the capacity, have the vital role uh, to play in our community to make positive social change and uh, have the capacity to provoke conversations that can lead to positive change. Um, we are at a moment in this country of widespread consciousness raising around the injustices and the collateral consequences of an excessively harsh and an all too often racially biased criminal justice system. In joining forces with Titus Kafar, an artist of tremendous talent and conviction, we hope to spark ideas that will move the needle on reforms and also to find new connections amongst us so that we can do this work together. As part of that, I hope you will all come see the exhibition at ArtSpace and the creative output of the Apprentices. This is a group of 16 New Haven Public School teens who worked with Titus Kafar to expand his Jerome project to New Haven. You'll be hearing more about that tomorrow, uh, and you'll be seeing some of the apprentices perform here tomorrow as well. What's unique about the next two days is that every panel will be headlined by an artist to show how a creative vision can expand our dialogue. What is also unique is that we have assembled individuals working across the spectrum of criminal justice issues. Individuals who often aren't in the same room and who usually are not at the same table. So from law enforcement to the private sector, to young people, to clergy, to community activists, and to artists. I want to acknowledge my colleague Sarah Fritchie, Leland Moore, the entire ArtSpace staff, and my wonderful ArtSpace board. Some of you are here. If there are ArtSpace board members, I invite you to raise your hand uh, so that we can acknowledge you. Um, and there are several more. There are several more ArtSpace board members out at the registration table uh, greeting, uh, greeting all of you. Um, the Sturdena Foundation, the Connecticut Humanities Fund, the Lustman Fund, 
the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, the Tau Foundation, and the City of New Haven Arts, Culture, and Tourism Office. Without their support, um, and without all of you here participating in the conversation, none of this will be possible. So thank you all. Um, I will be your MC, and uh, uh, in that role, I am delighted to invite uh, Aliyah Swaby from the New Haven Independent, our moderator, and the artist Kenya Robinson to open our first panel. Hi, my name is Aliyah Swaby. As Helen said, I'm a reporter for the New Haven Independent. Um, I just started there a year ago, um, and I report on education, on transportation, on zoning issues. Um, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this conversation on race in the media. I thought it would be interesting to focus on the way that uh, media uh, provokes conversation about race and the way that the public consumes that and interacts with that. Um, so first I would like to welcome Kenya Robinson, uh, who's going to do a, a performance art piece before the panel starts. True guineas. They took over their piece of the city. We're so hung up on this notion that we have some obligation to help this struggling black man, you know, cut him some slack until he... historical injustices. We just crap in Christ, Lincoln freed the faith. 130 years ago, how long did it take to get your act together? After an Irishman couldn't get a fucking job, we had the presidency. May rest in peace. That's what the niggas don't realize. If I got one thing against the black chaps, it's this. No one gives it to you. You have to take it. You never hear an art. Why not? To bring the rational and the irrational. To the good and the evil. Because it does not always try. Sometimes. The dark side overcome what Lincoln called the bitter. This is a goddamn bitch of an unsatisfactory situation. Trust me. You are talking to a nigger! I want you to be nice until it's time to not be nice. No, I don't know. I admit to you. But it's not only against the law. Prejudice in the system. It's wrong. It's not a nice thing to do. I tried. Damn it. I did that. What we got here, the failure to communicate. I was born a poor black child. I'm not black anymore! <laughs> One in every three black males is in some phase of the correctional system. It's as plain as the nose on your face. Would this like to be a black person? Possible. I'm Mr. Black Deacon, but I don't... But these people have a racial commitment to crime. Most people never have to face the fact that it's the right time, the right place, and they're capable of That's an attitude calls for the most delicate judgment on both sides. Because as you know, in the heat of action, men are likely to forget where their best interests lie, and let their emotions carry them away. Before we go rushing out in this, wasn't that ain't going to be so pleasant? Let's be sure we know. But what, briefly yours is now mine. Now I have precisely the right instrument, precisely the right moment of history. Your history. In exactly the right place. Great principles don't get lost once they come to light. I'm here. Just have to see them again. Thinking and calling it something else and alleviating the responsibility that these people have for their own action. I take away reason and accountability. It's not a riot. It's rage. It's not crime. It's poverty. This is nonsense. It's bullshit. We should never be allowed to get in the first place. The system's done not for me. I'm like a new man. For the first time in years, I feel clear. I know what I want. I know. 
what I've got to do, and nothing's going to stop me ever again. I think I'm entitled to extend me some fucking courtesy. We have a job to do now. Let's do it. I want rustlers, cutthroats, murderers, bounty hunters, desperados, mugs, punks, thugs, nitwits, halfwits, dimwits, vipers, snipers, con men, Indian agents, Mexican bandits, muggers, buggerers, bushwhackers, horn swagglers, horse thieves, bull dice, train robbers, bank robbers, ass kickers, shit kickers, and we're gonna keep out the niggas. We've got entirely too many troublemakers here. You want answers? People are no damn good. Every man carries a circle of hell around his head like a halo. Every man, every man has to go through hell to reach his paradise. I know we're all pretty small in the big scheme of things. And I suppose the most you can hope for is to make some kind of difference. But what kind of difference have I made? What in the world is better because of me? Thank you, Kenya. I would like to now invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, under an under two minute introduction per person would be great. Um, and then we'll have Dr. Courtney Baker uh, with a presentation. Hello. I'm. Uh privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Josh Kovner. I'm a newspaper reporter for about 30 years or uh, more. I, I work for the Hartford Current. I was in New Haven for 11 or 12 years. Uh, I have had the privilege of covering about eight or nine cities in Connecticut over, over that time, including uh, Hartford, New Haven, New Britain, Middletown. Uh, and. Uh, there's been a, a strong spirit in every one of those communities. Uh, I've, got, I've got the chance to witness that myself, but I've also seen a, dis a growing disconnect between the people who run for office and the people who live in those communities and the people who police those communities. And I think maybe that's why we're here. I think we're going backwards. And, and we'll talk, we could talk more about that, but uh, it, when I first was a police reporter, there was an us versus them mentality around the police. Police knew better. Then there was a uh, sort of an evolution to community policing. And for some years, there was a softening and a welcoming of community input. And I think in the last couple of years, we've, that's dried up. And I think we have to, the media has a responsibility of pounding on that and trying to, trying to get that back. Hi, I'm Kirsten West Savali, senior writer for TheRoot.com. Primarily, I focus on race and racism and how white supremacy influences the insidiousness of it, influences all aspects of black life in this country. And particularly over the last year, I've done a lot of writing uh, pertaining to the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement for black lives, and how grassroots organizations will actually be the ones to change the conditions of black people in this country, and it cannot come from the top. So I'm happy to be here to discuss that. How are you? My name is Frances Robles. I am a journalist with the New York Times. I've become something of a specialist in police misconduct issues. I started doing that in the late 1990s at the Miami Herald uh, when I uncovered a group of detectives, of uh, street uh, patrol officers who were framing um, 
mostly entirely all of them black men, uh, which eventually led to the police officers going to prison. I spent uh, a year covering the Trayvon Martin case, and then I went to the New York Times where I uh, un uncovered misconduct uh, at a Brooklyn, uh, by a Brooklyn detective that led to so far six murder convictions being overturned. Uh, I covered the Ferguson case, I covered the Walter Scott killing in uh, South Carolina, and also the massacre in Charleston. So um, I'm also happy to be here to discuss this important issue. I'm Courtney, ba I'm Courtney Baker, um, and there is going to be a slide that's going to tell you where I'm coming from. I'm at Connecticut College. That's, don't you know where I, <laughs> and I have a, I roll deep, um, Connecticut <laughs> College. So um, I'm here in part because I just completed work and my book came out on, um, entitled Humane Insight, looking at images of African American suffering and death. And there I can trace from the mid 19th century to the 21st century with Katrina, the uses and the circulation of images of black suffering. Um, and so this panel, gave me an opportunity to continue to think about the, the place that um, images of uh, black lives and in particular black suffering and pain and even death have had in the media. So I put together just some images in, and some quotations just to give some keywords or to provide us with some keywords. Um, so here's the, the shooting, the recording of uh, Walter Scott's murder um, by the police officer, and um, interestingly enough, uh, and some people have, have found issue with this, that the bystander Santana is charging for the use of these images. Um, part of the reason for that, according to him and according to some others, is to stop the unquestioned, kind of endless playing in the background of images of black murder, to actually have to be invested in that. Um, and so here, a couple of questions that we might think about um, is how do we see race in these bystander news, photos, and videos? And how does seeing police interactions cast in black and white terms shape our national conversations about policing and race? And not just these, these moments of extreme um, violence, right? Um, but the everyday activities of stop and, and frisk. Um, really, I'm trying to be really brief. Uh, it's humane insight. <laughs> um, just two more counterpoints that also give us maybe some key terms here. There's a little bit, I'm framing this as a debate, though it wasn't really situated as a, a debate. Uh, Brittany Cooper in Salon um, being fed up with seeing these images of trauma and thinking about the trauma to uh, black identity. Um, I'm not convinced in this moment that this video and she's talking about the Walter Scott video, means anything. We watched Eric Garner die on video. We watched Tamir Rice die on video. video. The, officers killed both of the officers who killed both of them are free. Black people have no reason to trust that video evidence will lead to any significantly different outcome in the case of the officer who shot Scott. And for her part, Claudia Rankin in the New York Times wrote, the decision not to release photos of the crime scene in Charleston, perhaps out of deference to the families of the dead, doesn't forestall our mourning, but in doing so, the bodies that demonstrate all too tragically that black skin is not a weapon, as one protest poster read last year, are turned into an abstraction. It's one thing to imagine nine black bodies bleeding out on a church floor and another to see it. And so I just want to say, I, I contemplated some of this um, in my own piece on Avidly about Sandra Bland, and I'll say that it seems that Claudia Rankin is really focused on mourning, and for Cooper, the key term is spectacle. So we might think about those two terms. And my kind of trying to think through this, like I said, this is an ongoing project because I think that the place of the media and what we mean by media is continuously changing. Altogether less certain is the role of the image in determining the future. For some, they function to ignite those involved in the movement toward the protection of black people's bodily integrity and dignity. Getting there has required and will cont continue to require a shifting of focus from black suffering to the ugly and unsustainable system of governance that depends upon black suffering, a denial of depression, and the ideal of femininity to survive. So those were just 
some awful images and some things to think about as we launch our conversation that I'm really happy to be able to participate in. Great. Thank you. Um, I would love to invite the other panelists to interact with that presentation. Um, what do you think are the, some of the limitations and benefits of having uh, these graphic videos and images go viral, which is made a lot more possible now with, with social media, with uh, sites like Twitter. Um, there, we, can, we have seen uh, videos, so Sandra Bland, we were able to see that traffic stop. We were able to hear what was going on. There are arguably benefits to having been able to have uh, legal scholars talk about whether or not the traffic stop was, was legal. Um, and then, as, as uh, Dr. Baker said, there are also uh, limitations to having those, those videos, horrific videos of, of black people being murdered, being, being hurt, uh, just traveling without people necessarily questioning themselves um, about why they're looking at them. Um, so maybe we can, yeah, can go ahead. Can I make a comment? One thing that I was really struck by earlier, just a few weeks ago, when the Virginia, when the two reporters were killed in Virginia, I thought it was fascinating that there was a tremendous amount of debate about whether to show those images. Uh, the Daily News got a lot of heat for it. The New York Times wrote an entire article about the heat that the New York, that the Daily News got for running the images. And the entire conversation took place without ever mentioning that we've been watching black people die all year. Yes, <laughs> now, I, and I, I've made this argument before, and people think that I'm arguing that we shouldn't be watch, playing the videos, and obviously as a journalist, that's, that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But w I don't even know what I'm saying. Like, what is that about? Like, how mm -hmm. can we have that entire conversation about whether to show these white people getting killed and not mention, oh, by the way, we've been watching it a lot already over and over and over again, but we forgot. And, we, and, and I forgot, and that's something that really made me mm. sad when I read the article about the Daily News, is that for a minute, I found myself engaging in that debate when I was like, wait a second, hold on. Anyway. Well, yeah. I, I see it as a safeguard. Uh, I see it as a, a necessity. When, at, when I teach at Southern and I tell the kids, you guys are often in a position to be journalists. Uh, Oscar Grant, when, when he got killed on the uh, subway platform uh, at the, the BART, uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit. The cop pulled his, uh, his service weapon. He th said later when he got off that it, he thought it was his taser, right? Uh, I, I think <laughs> we, we uh, now maybe, the, okay, so, so they're necessary. Uh, sometimes the pendulum has to go a little bit this way before it, it, it comes back a little bit. So um, it's, ne it's necessary, but the media has a responsibility to not let those images stay as the defining images and, and, and stories of African Americans. There's an ethical obligation as deep as it is to get your spelling right to over the course of a year, and you could look, look at your local paper, your local newspaper's website, and think about over the course of the year, is, is there more than just murder? Is there, are, are we talking about the kids who go to Yale? Are we talking about the, the things that happen in the community? Are we talking about the magnet, magnet schools and what goes on in these magnet schools? If you, if you wanna see some kids that'll knock your socks off, go to, go to one of these magnet schools. A diverse population and, and they're really, so the media has, a, a responsibility to not let those images be just hanging out there as all there is. Okay, we need to see these videos, and the cops need to see them, and I hope they're uh, part of training. Every police department needs to train on these. But there's also a responsibility to paint the whole picture. Well, I think first we have to broaden the lens a little bit. There is a fetish with black death in this country. It's historical, it's also contemporary, it's not anything new. Um, talking about the two reporters that were killed, there was also James Foley where images of his death were scrubbed from YouTube. It was, we can't see him like that. Uh, yet we have lynchings, uh, pictures of lynchings that are considered art. Uh, there's a, we are dehumanized, white people are dehumanized in this country. So for me as a reporter, it has taken me to realize that 
the images are not so much what they will do or how they will make white people feel. It is how it will mobilize black people. It's the shifting in how we view it. So it's very necessary. You know, there's, there's, of course, there's a voyeuristic aspect to it. But it's very necessary that we see them. You know, Mamie Till, of course, with her son said, we need to see this. Um, we have to. We have to. We can't hide it. We can't hide it. It gives some people who would not even consider themselves racist. And, you know, when we talk about institutionalized racism, people are benef benefactors of it, whether they consider themselves racist or not and it enables them to turn away and say, oh, this is horrible, we don't, I can't look at this. You need to look at it because you are a benefactor of the perpetuation of it. So I think we have to continue to see it. Okay. No, I was just gonna ask Kirsten, I know that you, uh, your work has focused on, on grassroots movements. I feel like that's a, another major part. So we have these videos of uh, black people as victims, but mm -hmm. then there are also uh, black activists who are doing really great work. Can you talk about um, how to portray those movements responsibly as a journalist? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think there is a, we talk about black rage. That's kind of been a defining uh, description of these movements. Black people are angry and we are angry. You know, we should be angry. Everyone should be angry. And I think when we talk about these movements, you know, it's the grassroots organizations. There's a responsibility that we have as the writers to paint them in the context of what's happening. It's not just police violence, it's unemployment, it's, it's lack of health care, it's food deserts. All these things play into how we look at black people in America. And I think that's what these organizations are here for. They're to shine a light on all aspects of, you know, the police, they're, they're the last, they're the militarized arm of white supremacy. The, the, the view, black people have already been painted as criminals. We've already been painted as people who need to be uh, uh, watched, people who need to be cornered, people who need to be suppressed. So this is what these organizations are doing, saying we are human. You know, we can't talk about civil rights. Malcolm X said this. We can't talk about civil rights until we talk about human rights. You know, so this, this is a human rights issue, a human rights issue, not a civil rights issue. And I think that's what these organizations are here to show. Dr. Baker, did you want to say something? I, I, could, uh, I could say that, um, oh, I'm sorry, that I, I guess the thought just fled. Maybe I'll, I'll get it back, I'll get it back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so can we uh, maybe talk more personally about uh, times where you think that you've uh, covered race uh, particularly well, and then maybe times where you've, you've learned from it and, and moved on with the understanding that you could have done something better in your work? I, I remember <laughs> the wrong people are running for office on a, on a local level. There's some good people, but see the, the machine stuff, the machine politics, whether it's Dems, Republic, it's, it's not working anymore. Do, I think, don't we see that? I mean, I think on a local level I'm talking about. The mayor of a city of Hartford or New Haven, um, maybe they think themselves as little governors or little senators, or maybe they have aspirations for high, but you have, they have a huge responsibility. I think they should be out there much more. And um, it was mentioned that, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think another thing that's been lost is sort of a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. We used to have more co cooperation and connection between economic development people and housing code and, 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 and fire safety and, and health safety and quality of life. And the cops are the last or they're just part of it. They're just, they, I don't think it's quite fair to put everything on them, you know? And, and as far, if I was a leader of a community, I sure as heck, I'd have the economic development people in, in raid jackets, you know, and, and juice them up a little bit because they perform a very important role. These vacant properties, uh, a lot, you, you think of yourself, would you, toler, do you, would you tolerate living next to a vacant building for, for five years with people squatting in it and safety violence. Well, that's what happens in a lot of the neighborhoods that don't get enough attention. People, law-abiding people, 90% of the people in, in these communities are law-abiding and they want what, what everyone wants, peace of mind, yet they're forced to live in next to squalor or out of control environments. And I think it has a lot to do with the leadership. 
that people should be out there. People we elect should be out there every day making sure that there's fairness between one, between one community and another. I'll tackle your question. I don't know that I want to tackle any mistakes that I've ever made because, of course, I've never made any. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, when the one, one time that I remember the media as a whole kind of bungling a race issue is this inability to accept that George Zimmerman was Hispanic. I mean, just live with it, deal with it. He's Hispanic. The guy's Spanish is beautiful. You know, okay, his mother, his father is American, so technically he's only half uh, Hispanic, but I mean, he's completely bilingual. He grew up with his grandmother. And I felt like, first, the media, they didn't, I don't know, I guess they weren't reading my articles because I early on always said that he was Hispanic. And then people sort of caught on to that late, and, but, but they had already framed him as white. So then it was like, oh, okay, so, and then I started seeing, even in the New York Times, I started seeing <laughs> He identifies as Hispanic. Well, what does that mean? He identifies as Hispanic, that he is Hispanic? Like, why can't he just be that? And the fact that he's Hispanic, how does that change your narrative? It doesn't change your narrative, that there's racial bias among Hispanic people and black people. Like, oh, but he can't be racist. Like, the, you know, you saw a lot of that, especially among broadcast media, that they felt like it could no longer be a race-related issue if he was Hispanic because, of course, you know, we all know that no Hispanics are ever racist. Um, and so I, I just felt like the media never recovered from that. They never knew how to handle him when he wasn't what they wanted him to be, which was white. Right. Well, I mean, it, just to push back on that a little bit, just because he's Hispanic doesn't mean that he's racially not white, and it doesn't mean that he's not a benef benefactor of, of white supremacy. And I think he navigates the world that way. So yes, I think that you know we have to be accurate in how we portray him. But you know that there are Afro Latinos, there are you know there are white people who identify as Hispanic. You know, so I I think that what was important there is that he was able to navigate a criminal justice system that is is partial to white people. He was able to get the the benefit the 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 the, the um, when we talk about the media, how they portray white people, he was able to get that. He was not vilified at all. So, you know, and, and Latinos and Hispanic people are vilified just as black people are. So I think that's what we saw in the media is that, that he was, he's a nice person. He comes from a nice family. He was watching the community. And, you know, he's, he terrorized Trayvon Martin. And I think it's very, very important that when we talk about racial issues is how he is positioned in society because they thought he was completely white i mean i wonder, well yeah i you know i wonder very often if his name had been george rodriguez how that whole thing would have been differently would you have seen the the calvary and so to speak in terms of uh jesse jackson and and uh reverend sharpton would they have come would the media have framed him in the way that you're that you're right would he have been able to navigate well if that he was well? george rodriguez he would have been jailed right well that's true that's a you know so it's, but it's interesting to me in the sense that I think that's a, that's a, to answer the question that was being asked, mm -hmm. a time that we, that we didn't get it right. Mm -hmm. I, to kind of piggyback on that and what I, what I did wrong, or, or what I noticed after I finished my book, and I don't mean to be keep harping on it, but this, this is plug what it. I wrote. It. I'm not <laughs> plugging it. So much it's is it's human insight. It's, so much <laughs> is it, it's on my mind. Um, is that I focused on the way that images function for white people and white supremacy. And so when there's a kind of slippage, right? We're talking about race in the media, and when we're talking about black bodies, we're talking about seeing blackness through white su supremacy. Or we're very consciously talking about fighting seeing blanket blackness through the lens of white supremacy. And I think it's important to name white supremacy as an ideology to which everyone can subscribe, even black people, even Hispanic people, right? Mm -hmm. Just to regard the black body as the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so I think white supremacy might explain and does to some, to some extent accounts for how that particular narrative about George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin Absolutely. got pr produced, provoked, and circulated in a very particular way. It's because the specter of white supremacy and that ideology is so ingrained that it's, it's actually hard for all of us, I think, to see, to see it in a much more complicated and nuanced ways. I see a mistake um, presently 
me with the title of the talk in general about race in the media, mm -hmm. but I mean, there are many people, like overwhelmingly represented um, by people who I think self-identify as black or African-American. And I think that that's fine, but I think that like this kind of um, euphemism for blackness being called race is um, schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. And I think that that ends up confusing the conversation a lot. Because if we can't even utter the word, if we can't say blackness in the media, or black people mm. in the media, or blackness and criminality, or whatever, then like, where do we go from there? Especially if we, the only way that we communicate is through our use of language. Great point. Does anyone wanna respond? Um, yeah, one more point to how black people are portrayed or a mistake that I see is the kind of um, ranking of black lives, who is worthy of, of uh, mourning, who is worthy of a benefit of the doubt. There's this respectability factor, especially when we saw Mike Brown, you know, let's back Jonathan Capehart, who, who came out just, just cowardly so, and said that hands up, don't shoot, was a lie. Well, you know, the lie is that he deserved to be shot. The lie is that his life was any less significant if he was a college student or, or if he was middle class. So I think that's, that's a big way that even, even black people subscribe to the need to prove our worthiness in the media. You know, this is, this is a good person. Jonathan Farrell, he played football. He was a nice person. Well, it doesn't matter if he's sagging. It doesn't matter if he's poor. It doesn't matter what he's done. He does not deserve to die. No one deserves to be shot down just because of the color of their skin. So I think that's where we also are complicit in kind of perpetuating white supremacy. Um, I also think that part of writing about race as a journalist is, is writing about whiteness. Um, and I think that uh, in, it's been uh, critiqued uh, a lot recently that uh, white killers are portrayed as, as human and relatable while black victims um, are portrayed as as monsters, or their their flaws are are overwhelmingly focused on. Um, how do you think, uh, as journalists or as as uh, academics, as people who who create or form this this media, how can you be responsible in, in portraying in portraying whiteness and, and talking actively about whiteness? Well, I, I think uh, some of the biggest perpetrators of violence in our time are the white school shooters the profile mm -hmm. of, of the school shooter is a white kid from a, a middle class, upper middle class. Uh, you, don't, you, you don't see any blacks doing it because disputes and, gr and grievances are settled differently. Uh, so I think it, it, to, to me, uh, it, w it's, it was very important for me to, a few years ago uh, to understand that and, and to keep keep that in my head, that the worst of us are, are these disaffected white school shooters. And whatever is making them uh, do this, not, not only school shooters, but mall and church and, and uh, the active shooter. It's another thing I say to the kids at, at, at uh, Southern. The, this term, active shooter, you, this is your term. This, you guys are growing up with this. It, it, Ten years ago, what, what did it, we didn't know what that meant. So I think that uh, the worst of our time has been, has been these these mass shooters. And um, you uh, you reported on the the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, yes. right? And you you did a lot of profiles on on the shooter. Yes. How did how did race play into the way that you portrayed Adam Lanza or the way that you reported on the the shooting? I tell you, I didn't. I didn't think. That, I didn't think much of, about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, t to me, you know, here's this. This was a perfect profile. Uh, mm -hmm. This. This was a little bit of Columbine. Little. Uh, he. He. Uh, he had it all. He had this fixation on 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 mass murder. He followed it on Wikipedia. He edited the. He had these little, you know, OCD type 
obsessions with you got to get it right. Make sure that the you know that the guy who killed uh, four women at a at a in a health club used a 45 you know Smith and Wesson. Don't call it a Ruger. You know he actually made corrections in 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 Wikipedia. Uh, I, I it, he floored me. I and I and I just I came to know that this is that he 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 fits the profile mm -hmm. uh, and that. Uh, in, in covering uh, New Haven and, and Hartford and, and, and New Britain and, 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 and Middletown and, and seeing uh, mostly what I've seen is, is, is black kids, African American kids going to school and wanting to get, wanting to get an education and having to go through, uh, in Hartford they were gonna, the feds were gonna take over Hartford, the school system at one point. Uh, that's what I've seen, okay? He, th this kid, this kid Adam Lanza, had everything you could possibly want. He had, he had the opportunities that we would all want, and this is how he turned out. He, and he needed a lot of help. He had mental illness. He needed help, and his mother was one of those, you know, kind of uh, wasn't big on, on psychology and medication, and Yale Child Study told, uh, told Mrs. Lanza, you got, a, you got a sick kid here at 13 years old. And it was like, uh, we'll, get, we'll get by, we'll get by. And that's what happened. And I think, I think what, to, to some of what you're talking about is there's this notion of curability amongst that is attached mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, white perpetrators of violence. Whereas um, there's this notion of base in humanity, intrinsic in humanity that extends back from to the beginning to the um, let's call it the illicit founding of this country, the United States. Right? Um, we can read Richard Wright, native son, right? The depiction of Bigger Thomas in the newspaper, which Richard Wright drew from an actual case and coverage that referred to uh, the young black killer as a monster, right? As a beast in the jungle, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, no, there's no language there, and I think this extends even to policy, right? Down to DC, and where the investigative energies are being expended into the pathologies of blackness, the pathologies of black life, going back to 1971, the Moynihan Report, the problem of the black family, right, as being this pathological aberration of what the family should look like, which is modeled on a white middle class, upper class, nuclear, uh, um, heterosexual family, right? So it's, it's again, I think, yeah, this, this notion of white normalcy with aberrations and black spectacular dysfunction that's intrinsic and endemic that creates these narratives that make it hard for any of us to get outside of and, and name the differences and the problems and wh why we don't profile. And is profiling really what we want to do as a universal? Do we want to make that more universal? Um, but think about the disparities, disparities in profiling that you're talking about. Just to speak to that a little piggyback on what you said is that there is an issue with, with mental illness. There, there absolutely is, and there are stigmas surrounding mental illnesses that need to be addressed. Um, the idea, though, is that it's used as an excuse to excuse mm -hmm. white criminals of what they're doing. So if we talk about mental illnesses and how it affects black people, you know, there, there's a post-traumatic stress syndrome at play. There's, there's poverty, there's, there's constant profiling, there's constant suppression, and none of that is ever taken into consideration, ever. And when we talk about politics um, and, and how white supremacy is, is a system, and institutionalized racism is a system, we have you know, a black president, we had a black attorney general, and we are in some of the worst conditions we've ever been in in our life. And so we have to really look at the, the entire picture and how you talked about NA criminality. I think it's very, very important that, that we look at the, the, the whole, the context of what's going on. Black people are not more prone to being criminal, even when um, they said that Mike Brown was like a demon. Darren Wilson said he was like a demon coming towards him. 
you know, uh, this, this language that they, they make up. You know how black people talk. The, there are certain words that they say that they're saying, you know, uh, uh, they, it didn't happen. But it's based on, it affirms for people what they already believe about black people to be true. And I think that as, as media, it's our job to kind of disrupt that narrative and, and know, understand that fair and impartial automatically benefits a script that's been in play for decades. And when we talk about it, we have to tell the truth, not what we've been told is the truth, not what we've been told, the told to accept, not the language we've been given, but what's really happening to tell the true story. Right. Um, and Francis, when you were at the Miami Herald, you, you reported on uh, the Zimmerman case. Um, I think you broke the story uh, that Trayvon Martin had been uh, suspended uh, a few times, um, in part because he uh, had marijuana on him. I mean, people pushed back against that at the time. Can you talk more about the process of, of deciding what to report during that, during that trial, which must have been a, right. difficult? Well, for one thing, you're mixing up two different stories. That was a Sun Sentinel. My story was actually worse. My story okay. reported that he was caught with a bag of stone, what was, was kind of obviously stolen jewelry because it was like wedding rings and things like that, and a screwdriver. Uh, and it was described in the police report as a burglary tool. Um, so this was, you know, a hot potato that landed on our laps, and it was in the throes of the big, you know, as, as people were marching in the streets. And I guess my answer to that, which people don't really like to hear, is that when you're in the middle of a story that's that big, it is a big thing that's being covered all day long, everything is on the table, everything becomes newsworthy. And you really can't say, oh, well, because he was the victim, we're not gonna write about the fact that there's a police report that I have in my hand that says that he was caught and was suspended in school for having stolen jewelry. You just can't, and especially it, it, it it makes you an unreliable narrator if then they find out that you had it and you didn't run it because, oh, he was the victim in the shooting. I mean, we wrote a lot of stories about George Zimmerman that were really kind of irrelevant to the, the case itself. You know, I wrote about a time that he spoke out at a city council meeting criticizing the police. I wrote about he had uh, sued, he had a workman's comp, not workman's comp, like a, maybe, I don't remember if it was workman's comp or like overtime that they didn't pay. I don't know, he had some kind of work related lawsuit, he didn't show up for his own deposition, and he was fined. You know, was that relevant to the case? No, but everything was on the table. And uh, I caught a lot of hell for that. And, and that's part of what, I guess that's kind of what we sign up for in these kind of coverage, because there's a real expectation, especially from someone like me, because, because I've covered so much police misconduct, and I don't just cover police misconduct, I uncover police misconduct. I mean, I've, I've done some really serious work that have put people in prison and gotten other people out of prison so that the readers expect something from me that they don't want to hear about Trayvon Martin's burglary tools. Um, and, you know, it, it causes me a lot of uh, angst on, on Twitter. I mean, you get Twitter mobs coming after you. And those are days that just, you know, you don't log on for a few days and, and kind of keep your head down and go on to the next thing because, I have to do it. I just have to. I agreed. Uh, I, 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 it, but it doesn't change the confrontation, and it doesn't make Trayvon Martin any more, you know, deserving to die. I mean, right? And you, but nobody you, said he was. I mean, that's right, not right. the point. Right. But that's the picture being painted. He was a child, so therefore his school records, whatever. That's that's the responsibility of media, I think, to also tell a story and that's what I mean about how fair and impartial is bullshit I mean because what happens is maybe for the root I no mean, no that, not maybe for know. the root in media because when you have a mainstream media space whose job it is to perpetuate white supremacy basically and tell a story that paints this child as a criminal that's what the pushback is from that's why you got hell, because he's not a criminal. It's not important it that matter. he has a wedding ring. What's mm -hmm. important is that George Zimmerman defied orders, got out of his car, stalked this child, profiled this child, killed this child. But That's everything the story. has to be covered. The, everything he's a is child. His school everything records, no, no, story. his school records are not a part of the story. They're not a part of the yes, story. They're, they they're a part of the story to paint a picture that people want to say he's so, a so bad wait. person. Okay, so let me push back on that. If his Please school do. records showed that he was a straight A uh, star of the class Disciplinary play, records. Whatever. Disciplinary uh -huh. records for children, a criminal report. records in schools, mm -hmm. are not part of the story. They're not. But, so what but, is, but what his, and, but and, and first of all, in a country, in the, is, that, is, that, is that news? 
Did, I, did, did you? Everything was news. That is yeah. a disciplinary record. I do think you have to cover it. I do think you have to cover it. It's not a part of the story the way that it was, the way that that story was told was not correct. It was prejudiced, it was biased, it was intended to give George Zimmerman the benefit of the doubt. And that's what I'm saying about it being institutionalized. Fair and impartial is meant to further criminalize black people to follow this script. There is no way that it was important that Trayvon Martin had a wedding ring and a screwdriver when he was gunned down in the middle of the night. There is no way. It was not important to the story. So you, and as, as far as him having marijuana in his system, we live in a country where black people are still being overwhelmingly incarcerated and penalized for marijuana, while white people in Colorado were being lauded for it, and it's a part of this big narrative that we need to legalize it. So all of a sudden, we bring up the fact that he had marijuana in his system, like, oh, well, obviously, that means he's not such a good kid. So what? It's the way that people tell the story and it's the way that they skew the story based on their own implicit bias that is the problem with how these stories are covered, period. But I don't think that that story was told in a way that was skewed toward it George Zimmerman. It absolutely was. Oh, it no, absolutely it was. I don't absolutely I disagree. It was. It, it and it matters because now he is not in jail. Now everyone is saying, you know, and now he's, he's, he's this big criminal. Now we want to tell the story about domestic violence and how he's, he's criminal and how but he's a bad But we told that person. story too. Now, we told Really? That's true. Yes. Look up the stories. We I've talked read about the how he stalked people in the supermarket. That he stalked people in the supermarket. That he uh, that he pushed and hit a cop over a, a liquor when they were raiding a liquor bar. And we talked about how he had a case against his girlfriend that they bit each other or whatever. And they both called the police. We did every type of backgrounding type of story that we did on Trayvon. We did on George Zimmerman. Yeah. Everything Again, was on the Trayvon table. Trayvon Martin Everything. is a child. And when we talk about how we're painting these pictures. The confrontation, that we don't even know if it was a confrontation to the point that they're trying to say that it was. The confrontation at that point, he profiled this child, he stalked this child, he shot this child, and he got off. You don't give up fair and impartial. You don't. You don't. You know why? Because that's the pictures that people want to paint. Him, the point is, if you're going to say that, then it also needs context. You don't just say um, he was... He, he stole wedding rings and this was found on him. You also have to follow up and say, but this is not relevant to this story. If you're going to report it, if you're going to report it, he, he had zero point whatever amount of marijuana in his system. Let's talk about the fact that this does not affect his actions. This, this level of marijuana does not affect his actions. This does not make him a criminal. It's stopping the story halfway to paint a picture of criminality that was not there in that instance. He was walking home. So to create a narrative of, you know, he, he stole wedding rings, which we don't know. We don't know what happened. We're getting so this is all secondhand information. He is a bad, look at his, his gang signs. It was, it was unimportant. And the same thing with Mike Brown. The exact same thing with Mike Brown. Walter Scott, did he owe child support? It's the same story over and over and over and over and over again. We point to the victims and we put them on trial from the grave all the time. I, I disagree, especially on the Walter Scott. On the Walter, I disagree on the Walter Scott because the the child support was directly relevant to the reason he ran. So that 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 you, it had everything to do with what happened that day. The but reason he ran. There is a white woman right now who sent police on a chase, who got out of the car and danced to Future. Is she dead? That's me. That's was a different she shot? case. That, it is. There is a, a that naked cop's in white jail. guy. There is and that a cop naked is in white jail. guy on video turning flips and cartwheels down the street. There was not one gun pulled on him. Not one. The point is, if you're running, why are you shooting him? And he's in jail. That's the story, though. It was, oh. it, of course, his child support case is. You can say that, but that doesn't have anything to do with why he was killed. Is the point? But uh, should he not have run? Maybe, maybe not. Should he be dead because of it? No. But nobody's making that. Like, I, th I think we, we agree that it didn't have anything to do. Like what Mike Brown did at the convenience store before mm -hmm. he came into the officer's view has nothing. He, the officer didn't know what Mike Brown did before. So it only, you only start the clock when Michael Brown comes into the view of the officer. That's mm -hmm. what we need. To, to pay attention to, but I do agree that if you're covering this 24/7 and there's a lot of competition, you do have to cut. And you you get a police report, 
that's, that talks about, you know, you have to have the context and you have, you to, have to, you have the Yes. Courtney, but, do you want to? I think, I think you do have to cover it. You do have to mention it. So I just want to say that we're having, we're having, I'll put it in one way, we're having a debate about journalistic ethics up mm -hmm. here. And I want to push back a little bit on y'all who easily clap and talk, ask about readerly ethics, right? Remember when we were like video games are making people crazy and shooting things, right? Um, and it figured consumers of images of media as basically idiots. So do you, we really want to say like the media made me do it? Isn't that a Chris Rock joke? So I want to say that yes, this debate about journalistic, ethic, journalistic ethics needs to happen, but I think we need to really spend a lot of time on our own as readers, thinking about what it means to be ethical readers, thinking about how we're reading things through a white supremacist narrative. What do we expect to read? What seems like a remarkable story? The kind of respectability politics that we're laying on Sandra Bland, but she's pretty, but she was smiling in these pictures, right? But she was also actually really struggling with depression mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. right? We don't, do we really need to have, what do we need to know? What do we need to know? So let's all know that we're participating in producing these narratives, right? As we're reading as much as when we are writing them. Uh, once I wrote a piece and I was saying how institutionalized racism was kind of a poison that mainstream media pushed into the veins of people to say, to invisibilize black people. And I called it a hypodermic needle and to, push, to, to piggyback what you said, it's not a hypodermic needle. It's not an immediate kind of reaction to these things. It's, it's an IV drip. It's constant, it's constant, it's constant. It informs how police treat you. It informs how readers view you. It informs whether or not they agree that this person deserved to be shot. And media and readers are absolutely complicit in what stories they choose to cover, what pictures they choose to paint, and, how, and what they're, benefit, what they're benefit, benefiting. White supremacy is at the root of all of it. And you can say this is, this is why I think black media is needed. It's absolutely needed because it is framed as fair and it is not fair. It is not taking into context historical instances. It's not taken into context. We talk about police. It started from slave patrols. You know, we talk about media. Who, who ran ads for runaway slaves. The, the story is not that the slave ran away. The story is why is he a slave in the first place? And so we're very, very, we need to be very, very aware of what we think is fair, what we think is necessary. And if we're going to tell the who, what, when, where, why, don't forget the why. Mm -hmm. Don't forget the why. And I'm seeing a lot of that happening in mainstream media. Slavery. I put slavery in quotes because I've been thinking about, um, again, the use of language. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think that um, slavery is, the word slavery is actually um, a correct term. I think it's imprisonment because that models that, that like, I feel like people have often said, oh, it's this, ex like, um, even after the abolition, after the abolition of slavery, that that they still that there was still this um, like the um, the penal system how it developed right after like right actually during Reconstruction is this thing that we're seeing now and I'm like oh no actually it was always about surveillance it was always about it what it didn't follow any of the modes of slavery as is existed as a word, the etymology of it. It has much more in um, in relationship to imprisonment. And again, it's like when I was able to unpack that word and really identify it, I think at least closer to the actuality of it, it makes me see these uh, the present situation much more clearly. And I, I don't know, I think, in the, in the same case, like how do we even go back to that time and reframe like the conversation in terms of the language mm -hmm. about what it, cause it's like, because it's been abolished, it's again a schizophrenic situation where you're in. It's like, it's been abolished, but why is it still here? Cause it's not, it wasn't that, it was this thing. That's why it's still here. And to, just to add to that, the slavery wasn't abolished. Yes, absolutely. It was, if you actually read the amendment, 
right? It says, except under, as a form of, it can be used only as a form of punishment. So it's legalized in prison. And what do you think happened after emancipation? New laws that created ways for black people to be arrested, like loitering, right? This is the work that Ange folks like Angela Davis and Joy James are doing, this kind of historical research about the language. Uh, can we uh, talk about language um, in the process of, of creating journalism or, or creating this media? Um, have you uh, ever had some pushback from an editor or con conversations behind the scenes about how to, to use certain words to describe uh, certain kinds of people, to describe black people specifically? Um, I know from my own personal, when I talk about it, when we talk about slavery again, I try to always make sure I say people who were enslaved to make sure people realize that it's a system, that this person is not intrinsically less value, this person is not property, that it was a system of enslavement. So I do always try to do that. Um, it's, it's alleged, I see it, the use of allegedly, alleged this, alleged that, when it's very clear what the crimes are. Um, I, I had pushback on it from editors when I referred to Dylan Roof as a terrorist. You know, there's very specific language that, that constitutes a terrorist. Well, I consider gunning down nine people in a church to be a terroristic act. So that's, I, that's as far as language goes, is, is this kind of, uh, and again, where implicit bias comes in. Dylan Roof was baby-faced, and he was smiling, and he was, no, that is the face of evil. So I think we really have to be aware in how we use language, but I have gotten pushback in that mm -hmm. regard to make sure that it's, it's fair and impartial to people who are clearly terrorists, yeah. Um, when, I, when I was in New Haven um, years ago, I guess uh, mid-90s, there were 35 homicides in New Haven, and at that point it was the highest number. There was drug turf uh, turmoil. 34 of the 35 victims were African American. So my editor said, we're gonna run a little blurb with a photo on all 35 victims. It was one white kid from the suburbs who was gunned down by uh, buying drugs. Everyone else was black as, vi as a victim. So in the newsroom, we're faced with, we're gonna have two facing pages of 34 black faces, uh, and we're defining them as murder victims, wh which they were. But the problem with that is you, over the course of the year, you better have done a hell of a lot of other stories because uh, you don't want to leave that image. And I remember uh, a couple of people who um, were, were work, organizing and working hard begged the, the editors not to run that. And they, and they, they did. They ran it. And it was two facing pages, 34 black faces, murder victims. And it, it, so there was, some, there was a lot of discussion there. Um, I, di I didn't want to see it. Uh, we just spent the year covering. Uh, we didn't need a rep retrospective on, on it. Uh, what we needed was more coverage about all uh, other things that are going on. Uh, uh, but that, but that isn't it better than having the 34 suspect faces? Those are the pictures that really make me mad. I, I'm noticing more and more minors. Like in my day, you didn't put, you didn't name suspects if they were minors. And now not only do they name them, but they put their picture right there on the web. And then if the charges are later dropped, we're sorry. <laughs> you know, like I find that bizarre. Yeah, they, they also use their school records um <laughs> well that was a police report it was a that was a yeah. police report so a police um, report is something else yeah I, i've i've seen where particularly how media covers stories um even looking i did a, a really in-depth report about the charter school system in in new orleans post katrina mm -hmm. and there's there's not very much uh talk about the school to prison pipeline <laughs> and how how these students are actually funneled into prisons um based on, it was like 98% of, of the children in the juvenile justice system in New Orleans were black, like 98%. And they take these kind of, these schools that are, um, the, the, the process is selective, 
to get them into these schools and then if they don't perform or they have special needs and they're sent to another school and the suspension rate and the expulsion criteria is so very much uh, just penal system like and then they take them to these alternative schools and from there you know they're into the prison system and then you have these lost children who aren't in they aren't employed they don't have jobs and they're also falling into the prison system so again when we talk about media and the pictures that we paint for a lot of people you would say the charter school system is a success story look at these act scores look at how this is working this is benefiting black people without going beneath that surface and saying well what about these lost children what about for instance there's a school in chicago where there is like a hundred percent uh of, of black students black boys who graduate every year this is a beautiful story great story but what about the kids who are suspended or expelled because they don't meet this criteria because they want to paint this picture of success of respectability so I think it's very, very important, again, that media is not lazy. Mainstream media is not lazy. They don't stop at the point where they can affirm this picture of blackness that they want to paint and tell the entire story. Yeah. Um, I, think I, I want to clarify something, that in Florida, the school police records uh, are public record. So I just want to make sure that that's clear. Kudos. Um, so I think we're, we're running out of time, and we want to have time for our questions at the end. Um, so a last question, just to look toward the future. Uh, who do you think is, is getting it right, or what do you think media is getting right, and, and where do we go from here, from this conversation? I mean, just that it's getting covered, to me, is, uh, is in a huge advance. I remember in the late 1990s, when I was covering the, this group in Miami called the Jump Out Boys, that all you had to do was read the reports and it was really obvious that they were killing people and then planting guns on them. I mean, you just, anybody could tell that. They were like shot five times in the back and then, but the story said, oh, he was pointing a gun at me. I was like, really, how did he do that? Um, and nobody cared, nobody cared. And I was writing these stories and writing these stories and you know, I could break all the stories in the world, nobody, cared, nobody even followed up. Um, so the fact that this is at least on the front page of you know every newspaper you know in the country, to me, even if we're not getting everything right, uh, I feel like oh, you know finally, finally people don't real realize that everything the police say is not necessarily true. You know, it, it took a long time for people to finally figure that out, for for reporters to figure that out. Anyone else? Yeah. What? I um, went to a, a dinner with a bunch of artists and you know, we're just, I don't know, licking our toes or whatever, or rubbing on our bodies and engaging audio. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and, and we're talking about this notion of, of transnational blackness or whatever. And of course, I consider myself a mischief maker. I, I hope you all noticed the gift that I was giving you. Um, and I, one, I, I was like, um, I would like to um, kill blackness, and um, which means taking the crayon away, f the black crayon away from <laughs> white supremacy, because I feel like it's this thing that um, it's a tool that's used to draw the designation. But if they don't have the crayon, I, I suspect it would be interesting. But that's a theoretical exercise. But the thing that is not theoretical is that forever and ever and ever and ever, there will always be power in the hands of somebody that we don't want it to. And I think that it's so important that like journalists and culture creators, in spite of that reality, continue to just push back against that. That it's not, it's, it only looks like it's fruitless, you know, like it's our foolhardy. <laughs> so, thank you. Well, I will say we have to be very careful. Media is doing a good job of reporting what black people are doing. I think most of the credit goes to these grassroots organizations. It goes to the protesters. It goes to the revolutionaries. It goes to them for creating a story for us to report. So, you know, yeah, media is doing a, a good job in covering it, um, even, even with monumental mistakes. I think it's very important to make sure we recognize the people who are creating the story. Mm -hmm. Not so much that, you know, we're doing, we, we, don't, we, we don't get credit for telling the truth. It's, it's our responsibility to tell the truth. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we get a, a, 
Oh, I was gonna go for a uh, round of applause before questions <laughs> for our panelists. <laughs> Just to go back to the question of school records, um, I think, like you said, like it's of utmost important that of importance that the media be self-evaluative at this point. Um, but I just feel like you know, recognizing like we're in the process of recognizing how skewed we are in one particular direction. I don't know if to compensate by trying to skew in another direction would be the best way to take it. I feel like. I mean, and I could kind of see how, you know, his Trayvon Martin's police record might be pertinent to the case. Um, that said, what is that symptomatic of, you know? And uh, sh should, should we, is that something that we should use then, you know? I mean, I mean, <clears throat> sorry. It's just, yeah, I just, I just feel like as much information on the table as possible and then evaluating how we approach that information and then providing a framework for people to make, or providing a framework for, people to make sense of how they're interpreting that information as opposed to like, I mean, I, I think it's like less about like painting the picture as it is like putting the information on the table, you know, and then, and then being aware of how one might frame it, I guess. I mean, I understand that like your point that like nothing is like unbiased, but. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I, d I don't feel like creating a bias in the other way is like a way to compensate for it as much as it is to step outside of the system and say, we recognize that we have these intrinsic biases, this is the information, and then sort of like dialogue about how we're gonna make sense of it. So, so I would ask you, what do you think is the bias? What I mean, it's, you it's think clearly, is it, it's, it's clearly a white another. bias. It's a right. pro-white bias so, and an anti-black bias. Right, right, so I don't, I don't think that it's skewing it the other way. I don't think it's trying to create another bias. I don't think it's trying to say, you know, we're not saying that to, to combat white supremacy, we're just going to not tell a story and we're going to paint Trayvon Martin as this innocent, you know, in the lilies of the valley, just skipping around coloring rainbows. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that was not, that was specifically used in the, in the context of creating a picture of criminality. It was not told as this is, this is a fact. A, I have an issue with releasing a child's records, a school record, to paint a picture of criminality because that's what happened. Those were the headlines. Trayvon Martin, he, he, was, he was found with this. Trayvon Martin is not the good kid. Trayvon Martin is, is a gangster. Tray, Trayvon Martin listens to this kind of music. The same thing happened with Jordan Davis. So what I'm saying we have to push back against is leaving the story as is. There is no way in society as it stands right now that we can just say, here's the information, do with it as you will. Yeah. Because the bias is so deep. Well, then I would say, wouldn't you want to continue to you know, take that investigative framework towards this new information as opposed to saying, no, we're going to stop it here and we don't want you to look any further? I mean, like, no, wouldn't I'm there not be saying more don't look at it. I'm saying that the way it's contextualized, the way that information is used, is used to paint these pictures and that media stops. That's my problem, is that then media stops because yeah. they aff it affirms the picture that needs to be painted. That there's a picture painted of Trayvon Martin's criminality, then it, you don't go that step further and say, but this has nothing to do with this case. We're reporting this because this is a fact of this case. She feels it's necessary. I don't. I don't feel that it was necessary to tell the story of George Zimmerman terrorizing and profiling and killing a child. I don't. I think it was used specifically to paint him as a criminal, to paint him as someone who was possibly deserving of death. It was, it was also like a catalyst for a lot of people. It was something that was like really rich and a lot of people became engaged of because it's symptomatic of what's going on. So people wanted to get as engaged as possible. We wanted more information, you know what I mean? So I mean, right. that's, I, I just, yeah. I mean, I, you're, when you say like, oh, when it's, this, when it's painted, when they give that information, it's painted a certain way. Well, what is the alternative? Well, yeah. where I think that your point is spot on is the the delicate balance between the it's almost worse what you the coverage of the kids who were really good because then it's pretend, like what you were saying earlier then then it suggests that those wonderful scholarship winning you know mm -hmm. uh, band leader kids those were the kids that didn't deserve to die you know right, <laughs> the, you right. Know, that, that, right. that's where that's the where it gets tricky right I mean I absolutely get your point. 
I get your point. As a writer and as someone who reports the news, I don't think you should hide facts or skate around facts or not report facts. The problem that I have is how those facts are then used to paint pictures that criminalize black people. That's the problem that I have with that, and that's what it's used for. You see, and it's not the other way. It's not the other. You know, I would like to see when a police officer is gunned down, how many people did he profile? What are the crimes that he do? What's his record? But they do that every time. Yeah. No, they do. Of course. Where? Oh my God! What's, Go what, back. Where? When, I'm serious. When, tell okay, me so where. So the guy Michael Slager. Where I can tell you every person that he tased. I can tell you it's in. The, you can tell me. You can tell me. Because we covered it. Okay, but who do you know more about? Who do you know more about? Honestly, me. I know more about Michael Slager. How was it covered? Honestly, tell me how was it covered? You wrote a story, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not. I'm not here for like. Okay, but I'm not talking about all white people arguments. I'm talking about the picture that is painted, how it is, is reported. When those police officers were gunned down in Brooklyn, it was, oh, this, oh my God, this is, this is because of the Black Lives Matters movement, and oh, this is, this is anti-police rhetoric, and oh, police are being gunned down all over the country. I, what did they do? What did these cops do? We don't talk about that. That is not the narrative that is being, you can roll your eyes all you want to. I'm not rolling my eyes, I'm shaking my head. I'm shaking my head. Your I'm shaking, your shaking my head, I'm shaking my head because I, I feel like you're because not reading. Because that is not, the, I'm, I'm what? Then you're not reading about the stories that everybody's writing no, about I'm invested cops. in these okay. stories I'm every day. Sorry guys, I mean, we're, we're at one right. minute. I just want to get to the last question. Right. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Okay, um, thank you all for your input. Um, Kristen, when you said, you mentioned earlier the ranking of black lives, it made me think about how police brutality has almost be, been solely symbolized by the murder of black men. Mm -hmm. And even in this conversation, we've mentioned Sandra Bland, but talked a lot more about Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. um, and Mike Brown. And so I just wonder if there's, if you have thoughts on if, or if any of you have thoughts on this, whether there's something about our notions of black masculinity that make those stories more necessary to consume than versus our notions of black femininity or, or trans mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. um, or Hispanics. Or Hispanics or people of other races. Yeah, I absolutely do think that black women are in, in, invisibilized in this narrative. Absolutely. Trans people, absolutely. And you know, I've written stories about black women's lives matter too. You know, that to talk about, you know, Marlene Pinnock and Rakia Boyd and, and you know, to talk about these people, Elaine Bumpers, to make sure that people know their name, Ayanna Stanley Jones, to make sure people know their names and that we're reporting on those. I think there's also, what you, what you said is true, is that when we're talking about the big story, there's this idea of, of black male criminality or black male pathology that people feel the need to push back to, to feel the need to kind of defend and say, you know, all black men are not bad and that kind of is pushed to the forefront because those are the voices that we hear. We have to absolutely interrupt that narrative. It's no excuse for it to be overwhelmingly about black men. But why do you think the stories of black men are the ones that catch on? That's a, not an easy question, but. I, I have an question, which is that um, like in the slavery narrative, like when we, have, when we think about that, it's almost overwhelmingly the image in our mind is of a black man. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like considered like the most important kind of, but it's like that's actually the opposite is true, mm -hmm. is that the black woman was kind of the, it was the most important part of that. So I think that um, again, it's these systems are meant to, I, I feel they're meant to speed us up, uh, to create um, an imbalance. And a great way of doing that is to shift your attention to the opposite of what is truly um, kind of integral to the conversation. So like, you know, when we think about, um, you know, the, the nuclear family, right, that really like, you know, in anthropology, the, the nuclear family is considered mother and child. So if you can like, create this thing that like doesn't even have anything to do with this kind of form, then you, you cut off that nuanced read that we want the, the readership to have. So it's like, I, I don't know, I always, I often feel like when I'm reading the newspaper or blogs or whatever, that the thing that um, is most focused upon 
is that I should actually investigate the opposite because I feel like that that's where the real story is. I absolutely agree with that. I think that there's also how people try to hide the story. You have to look behind and see what are you trying to to make us not focus on. But to your question, there's there's really there's really no excuse. Even when we talk about the, the slave narrative, it's you a know, purpose, but it's not an excuse. Right, right. Even when we talk about the slavery narrative, you know, you you see the black male, the man being lynched, but you don't pull the lens back to see there's a black woman right beside him, and there's a black child right beside him. You know, and we're there's this kind of. Um, uh, background kind of supporting role that police violence or state sanctioned violence affects black women as being adjacent to black men, but we are also the victims of it. We're, it's not just because we're mothers or grandmothers or daughters or sisters or aunts. It's because our bodies are dehumanized just as much. And so to answer your question, there's, there's no, we have to do a better job of doing that, to disrupt that narrative at, at every single, even when we t do lists, you know, we can run down Mike Brown, we can run down Trayvon Martin, we can run down Walter Scott and Jordan Davis, and you say, what about black women? Ah. Uh, I have a cynical view to that in the sense that I think it's all about the commercial aspect of the videos. You know, that if there was more videos of women getting killed, then that's what they would be covering. Um, and I, it's an, un, it's an inexcusable fact, but I think that that's a big part of it. I think we're actually out of time. Uh, so I think people can come up and ask questions after the panel is there is another over. panel using this We table? have, I will uh, step in. Oh. Thank you so much <laughs> to all the panelists. And Do we need to vacate the room? To Aaliyah we Swaby. We, we are gonna stay, we're all staying here right. over the next five minutes. You, we're gonna take a five minute break. Um, we're gonna invite the next panelists to come up and, and take, their, um, take their seats. And we will start up again at 4 o'clock. Is that the front of the you didn't see when you came in? I did, but no one was giving one to me.
Chocolate like raw cocoa before sugar. Sweet like devil's food with salt. I am black like, and you was like, and I was like, and we was like, get your hands out of my pocket. I am black like street with no lights. Black like city with no power. Black like city with power. Black like city with no power. I am black like moonlight shadows. Black like leather jacket you think is behind you. I am black like magic, like basketball, like taboo, like AIDS, like voodoo, like Africa, like we need special aid, section eight. Black like curses, like curse rituals, gang signs. I am black like eight ball, like bubbled in ballot, like black vote, like can't vote, felony. I am black like attending a funeral, like Grim Reaper, like 9 millimeter pistol, black like an usher, no, black like usher, scream. I am black like the first person to die in American horror films. Black like first person to die in the American Revolutionary War. Not black like the British are coming, black like 5 run. I am black like garden dirt. Fertilizing the harvest for a dark skin birth, breaking the stereotypical since I typically listen to stereos, typical, tip the shade of black lightly because I am brown, like back of the class, like the CL in class doesn't exist when I say I like your class. Like, I still parks my class in the backs of the bus by choice, brown like teacher had a duggy, brown like not your teacher. Brown like teacher says principal's office. Why? For being black like never getting an A on your project. I mean black like never getting your A out the projects. Because you always want to be with and hang with your boys and not be brown like W.E.B. Du Bois. Because you don't know it, but you built every last one of the Egyptian pyramids. And even though you are a slave, you made this entire nation with your bare hands. Period. I'm brown like, you know... I thought slavery was wrong too. Brown like, lock your car doors. Brown like, can I touch your hair? Brown like, Velcro like crows, like Jim Crow laws like Jim, the runaway slave in Huckleberry Finn. Brown like, I was always first picked in Jim because I was black. I mean brown like, Kendall on Clarence. Not like you so black, more like you're so beautiful. I am brown like panther, black. Brown like do the right thing. Brown like doo-doo. Brown like do nothing. Brown like I knows how to do everything domestic. My face is brown, not black like faces, not like rapper. I am brown like chocolate. Bite me. Thank you. Show some love, Sabia Abusador. Give him another hand. Give him another round of applause. I think it was a great County Cullen that wrote a poem during the Harlem Renaissance. We wear the mask. Yeah, check it out. Uh, Sabia, I, he, I guess he's probably the youngest person on the uh, on the panel, <coughs> Bobby. So I just want to say a word about him. Um, I've known him for, for a while, and his parents, his parents are great contributors to this community. His father, I think Shafiq, is on a panel tomorrow. His mother's doing a great job with health and fitness and awareness in this community. And I want to just acknowledge them because we stand on the shoulders of folk, all of us do. And I think oftentimes, just as the, as the previous panel just alluded to and addressed, many times, uh, sadly in our community, the, the absence of, quite frankly, positive, strong African-American male role models uh, is, is, it remains a challenge for us to we'll tackle a little bit in, in this panel. But I want to acknowledge this man's father for being who he is, it's not just to him, but also to this community. So I want to thank you and acknowledge to be here. So thank you, man. Uh, again, I'm Clifton Graves, Jr. My father always insisted that I use Jr. to distinguish the two of us in case I screw up, as I have done. I'm a lawyer and educator by training. I'm 
The, presently, I serve in the capacity of program manager for Project Fresh Start, which is the City of New Haven's reentry program for returning citizens of formerly incarcerated who return to our streets, appointed by Mayor Harp. And I want to just acknowledge the fact Mayor Harp, uh, Tony Harp, the first African American woman, of course, the first woman mayor of this distinguished city, had to be out of state today. And but she sends her regrets, but also her, her uh, commendations for those who are organizing, who have organized this event. So um, and we'll talk more about Project Fresh Start in, in a little bit. Also, if, you, if I could take this personal indulgence, this past week, this community lost uh, a great leader, a great writer, great contributor, who also I consider a friend. His brother's name was Khalid Lum. Some of you may not have heard of him, but Khalid was not from New Haven originally, went to Princeton, Princeton sorry, Yellies, went to Princeton, but um, we came to this community, served as director of the African American Cultural Center right down the street, and then served as director of the African American Historical Society here in New Haven, then served as director of communications for the first African American mayor, John Daniels. Um, but beyond that, he was just a great contributor, a great wit, and he would have loved this. He would have loved this type of dialogue, this discussion that we're addressing today. So I just wanted to acknowledge the life and legacy of our brother and our friend, Kylie Lum. Thank you. Just quickly, Project Fresh Start. Project Fresh Start, the prison reentry program for the city is the only city-sponsored, municipal-sponsored reentry program in the state of Connecticut. Um, John DiStefano, to his credit, former mayor, initiated this project. Mayor Harp, since he's been in the last 18 months, has expanded it. And we make, we're making a concerted attempt with, with the partners like uh, Amos Smith's Punitive Action Agency and uh, Kaisha's uh, New Haven Family Alliance, as well as Transitions Clinic out of Yale, uh, New Haven, Fam New Haven uh, Legal Assistance, and Project Moore to work, out, work, work together collaboratively for the first time in an unprecedented manner in this city to try to better coordinate and better serve, and also Project Longevity, I see Stacy Spell back there, Project Longevity, try to work on, on, a better, on, on better ways to address the needs and challenges that our returning citizens face. Every month, 100, 100 men and women are dropped off, released from the correctional institutions in this state back to the streets. Many without direction, most without hope. And while there are services in this community that, that, that attempt to address those needs and have done a decent job, we feel we can do much more and much better and much better in that area. And we're going to we'll discuss and touch on that a little later. But I assure you and I, uh, and I promise you, as Amos will, will certainly um, reiterate, that we're making po positive progress in, in the initiatives that we're undertaking. And I just ask you to stay tuned and also ask you in the words of that great philosopher writer, Bruno Mars, if you don't believe me, just watch. <laughs> in the history of um, in the African American experience, the African American culture, there are two words that epitomize, embody, symbolize that struggle, that ongoing st historic struggle. There's been resistance and resilience. Resistance and resilience. Folks who had the courage and the fortitude, the temerity and the tenacity to resist and had the fortitude, the courage, the temerity, and tenacity to be resilient in the face of all the challenges and obstacles that we face. So 150 years after the end of the Civil War, 50 years after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we have assembled a panel here of, uh, well, I said, I'm not sure what the name of this panel is, but I'm going to re rename it and reframe it as the panel of local activists, advocates, and agitators. <laughs> Bob, activists, advocates, and agitators. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being an agitator, certainly not an advocate or an activist. But these folks we've assembled uh, have committed their lives every single day to addressing the inequities that exist in our community and in the state and in the society. So we're honored to have, have them here, and we're going to get started shortly. But I want to just say this about these folks uh, we've assembled. As I said earlier, we all stand on the shoulders of somebody, those who've gone before, who fought this battle and fought this struggle. And certainly, uh, we, should, we shall be reminded and admonished by the words of Dr. King, that injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere, admonished and encouraged by the words of Gandhi, that we must be the change we seek. Finally, I think the words of Frederick Douglass, who uh, a role model to me, who, who, who challenged us all, over 150 years ago that if there is no struggle, there will be no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and deprecate agitation 
are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without the thunder and the lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its mighty waters. We may not get all we pay for in this world, but we must certainly pay for what we get. For power, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. If there is no struggle, if there is no struggle, there will be no progress. The words of Douglas that resound today. So those folks that I'm about, these folks I'm about to introduce, these activists, advocates, and agitators stand on those words, live their lives daily, trying to live up to the words of Douglas, of Gandhi, and King, among others. So since I'm old school, we're gonna start with ladies first. I don't apologize for that either. Uh, we're gonna start with ladies first. All right, so, brother, that's all right. Is that okay, Amos? Yeah, okay. That's all right. So we're gonna start first with a young lady who who I think certainly embodies the spirit of activism, advocacy, and certainly agitation. No question about it. Uh, we marched together, stood together, and sometimes we even disagree, but it's okay to disagree, as long as the disagreements are in principle, not on personality. Principle, not on personality. And so I certainly am honored to have the opportunity to introduce and present to you Ms. Barbara Fair. And Bob, Bob you go first. What we're gonna ask the panelists to do is just give a brief overview of who you are, what you do, and then we'll come back around and I have a few questions for you. All right. So first, Ms. Barbara Fair. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, briefly, what I do, I um, started an organization called My Brother's Keeper after 15 years of being in an organization called uh, People Against Injustice. And my primary uh, goal is to uh, first talk to legislators and people about uh, policies that get passed and and listen to how it's impacting uh, the people in, in our community and then to sometimes go back to the legislators and, and, and say, you know what, this policy is impacting people in a certain way, in a negative way, maybe a way that wasn't intended, maybe it was intended, but to at least acknowledge that and, and make people aware of it. Um, and that's primarily in, in a short sentence of uh, what I end up doing. I've been all over this country um, the working with people from all different um, organizations around criminal justice and, and prison. And I no longer say reform because I've been doing this so long that I know reform is not uh, anything that I can see that's going to happen. I think it's going to take a whole dismantling of this system and it's going to st have to start at the root of white supremacy and black inferiority. Until we're ready to do that, we're just wasting our time talking about reform. Bob, you see your barber hand. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> Next, a young lady who works with uh, one of our partner agencies, New Haven Family Alliance, who's committed her life daily to saving and serving, serving and saving our youth. She works as a youth, uh, I think, outreach worker and coordinator there for New Haven Family Alliance, as well as on the Juvenile Justice Reform Committee, I believe. So please give a warm welcome to Kaisha. Velasquez. Thank you. Um, I don't feel like I'm in league of my colleagues here. They're, I'm trying to achieve what what they represent, actually. No, I wasn't talking about age. <laughs> I was not talking about age. No. So. <laughs> So I'm Kaisha Velasquez, and basically, um, born and raised in New Haven, and very, 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 very passionate person, um, especially for our youth, because I once was a troubled youth myself, and because of circumstances and environment, and um, and I feel that with the right people by them si their side, encouraging them, um, and giving them access to resources that some of them can really turn their lives around and, and be examples for others. Um, what I would say is that my goal every day is to um, try to touch every life that I can, youth specifically, and I'm not just about individual help. Um, I'm for um, an, as a serious advocate for policy change, so I, I am a part of the group that began the initiative of diver diverting youth to, from the formal juvenile justice system on small minor offenses that shouldn't have been criminalized anyway, 
like school behavior should not be a criminal behavior and arrest. Um, so I've, and I've, right now I'm in the process of launching youth court. So then we could divert even more kids from the criminal justice system. But um, I'm also Latina. I don't know if you realize, but I am Latina. So, um, <laughs> so my, my focus is all youth, not just, um, African-American youth, but Latino youth too. And I believe that we all, if we take a moment and just speak a few kind words, we could reach a lot of young people today. Thank you, Kish. <laughs> this next young man has distinguished himself in, in, in many fields of endeavor. He currently serves as the chief executive officer of the Community Action Agency for City of New Haven, an agency that he's turned around the last several years. But more importantly, he, he has dedicated that agency and dedicated his life to serving, again, and saving folks in our, in our community. He's also a partner, as I mentioned earlier, with the, with the Fresh Start program in terms of trying to wrap our arms around this reentry issue. So please give a warm welcome, if we will, to my colleague and friend, Mr. Amos Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Clifton. Uh, uh, good evening, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, rather than talk about what I do at my agency, let me just say a few things about how what I do was shaped by who I was as a kid. And I grew up in the Jim Crow South, so I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, but I, was, I grew up as a kid living in a dual system of segregation. I grew up during a time in Vietnam I grew up seeing people leave my community, older boys leaving my community and coming back in boxes. And then I saw older boys leaving my community and not really understanding where they were going. And I understood later that they were going off to prison and coming back. And then I saw fewer older boys going to college. And so as a kid, I wondered, can I get out without dying? without going to prison. But I also understood that my parents, both of whom had escaped from the country and the farm in Georgia to Jacksonville, Florida to give their children a better start, neither of them had a high school diploma. In fact, they had a ninth, eighth and ninth grade education. But they wanted more for us than they could, do, they could get for themselves. And I have dedicated my life to do the same. And I hope that we have a chance to talk about what we're doing in Fresh Start because it is absolutely revolutionary. It is undistinguishable, one of the best conversations that's going on in this country about what we need to do for our community, for our families, and for our ability to recapture the lives of our children with regard to retaining them in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. About 20 years ago, I was serving as an administrator at Southern Connecticut State University, directing the uh, diversity program. And this young, brash student comes into my office and wants to challenge me about affirmative action. He wants to have a debate discussion about the, the, the efficacy of affirmative action. And of course, the new one here, that was his own radio show, and he invited me to be on his radio show to debate it, which, which is fine. And then, then all of a sudden he canceled the program. I'm not sure what happened. Uh, he just canceled the program. And 20 years later, Gary, I wanted to ask you why you canceled that program. But, but, <laughs> but that's another story. But, but since that time, he's gone on and seriously to distinguish himself as a great, great community leader and advocate, uh, first as a state representative who stepped in the shoes of another great leader and icon in our community, Bill Dyson. And then secondly, we got elected a state senator stepping in the shoes of another great leader who's now the mayor of our city. Tony Harp, and he's doing a great job in Harvard. He's been an advocate, been in the forefront of advocating for the abolition of the death penalty here in the state of Connecticut, been in the forefront of advocating for the Second Chance Act and trying to make things just a little better and, uh, and more manageable for folks being released from these institutions. And overall, has been just a staunch community advocate for New Haven and for the, the, the poor and the dispossessed uh, in this state. So please give a warm welcome to State Senator, the Honorable Gary Holder Winfield. <laughs> So, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't know why that show was canceled. Uh, 
It certainly wasn't because I didn't want to debate. Anyone who knows me knows that. Um, I, I guess to answer the question of um, what I do, I think uh, the answer that would make sense to people has something to do with legislation, but that's not actually the answer. Um, what I do is um, I attempt to do what I didn't see um, in the place where I grew up. I grew up in a housing project in the Bronx. Um, and what I didn't see there were people advocating for um, the issues that were important to me in the space that I occupied. Uh, what I didn't see were people who uh, were listening and then going forward and doing something about the issue. So that's what I have attempted to do in my life. Um, I did not want to be in politics. I actually spent a number of years with Barbara uh, on the streets of this city uh, in uh, those groups uh, being a pain in some people's um, posterior. Um, <laughs> And that's what uh, I actually really loved doing. But what I recognized was that in the places where uh, we would go to talk to people, uh, when, we left, when we were there, we were, I think, somewhat effective because people were disturbed by our presence. Uh, but when we left, uh, they could be comfortable again. Uh, and so, um, you know, I kind of was one of those people who would be like, I don't want to be in politics. And my predecessor, and, I, and by that I mean Bill Dyson, uh, said to me, well, if you don't want uh, people to remain comfortable, then you need to be in that space uh, when they are in the places where they're comfortable, keeping them uh, in a place where they're not comfortable. Uh, I didn't really have an argument against that. Uh, and so I wound up uh, running for office. I was not the person who was supposed to be winning my election. Uh, we won. And I have tried since then uh, to remember the work that I was doing with Barbara and others on the streets of New Haven. And so I, I've attempted to bring that into the state legislature. And that's what I do. And a final introduction back to the young blood, uh, Sabir Abdu Sabir. Sabir. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sabir Abdu Sabor. Um, what do I do? Dag? Um, <laughs> I've been doing youth activism since I was like 13. Um, started my first youth organization back in 2007 slash 8, around December called the Youth Revolution International Youth Development. 2012 started an organization called the Youth Day Project and recently started a bike club called Mass Maniacs. As you can see, you probably know what that does. Mm -hmm. um, I like the term you use, the agitation term. I love that term because mm -hmm. that's what that's basically what I do every day. I, I'm basically the agitation of New Haven County and not just New Haven. I get pulled over 20 times a year on average for the last two years because of this thing. So. Um, Born and raised in New Haven, um, basic nine to five, work at Starbucks out in Woodbridge, Connecticut over on Litchfield Turnpike. Um, aside from that, I also tutor with uh, Muck Mud LLC, kids K through eight, once or twice a week. Um, my focus for the last, especially for the last three to four years, has been to provide kids with the opportunity to have the full control over their free will and give them as many opportunities as possible. Because what I found is that a lot of the youth that are coming up today, they're pigeonholed into the situations that they're in. They, they don't have access to all of the good opportunities they could have. They're only sent to the bad ones and the good ones didn't really have access to the bad ones because of the way their life was set up. So. I figure give kids the opportunity to choose between what good or bad, they'll, they'll eventually choose the good. And particularly with mass, the Mass Maniacs program, I take kids throughout the city who have a good state of mind because we know the mass can go different ways. Um, and just do stuff like just ride around. All we do is ride around and play music. I play, I, I play music. I, I ride a bike. I take my road bike onto the half pipe at Edgewood Park. Um, I, I ride to and from work. I go grocery shopping with my mask on. I get pulled over by cops all the time. And a lot of the stuff that I deal with and my kids deal with with the mask is, in a lot of ways, if you look at it like, uh, if you, you start seeing stuff that is repetition from history, you'll, you'll see people walk on the totally on the other side of the street. People drive on a totally different lane. Um, parents... You, you guys know what this is. You know you know when that inappropriate thing come on TV and your five-year-old right there, you cover the eyes? Yeah, I get that when I walk down the street. Um, and just simple stuff like, especially with the way 
police brutality is big now um and observing everything that leads up to that because we don't have we, we don't have kids getting taken out in new haven the way it's happening all across the nation but small stuff like when an officer approaches you about something that they feel when they feel uncomfortable how they how they approach you from why is the officer approaching you with their hand on their belt why is their gun unclipped inside gateway when they're just patrolling gateway there's no reason why your gun should be unclipping gateway for it. any reason unless you're getting a call about somebody being a shooting or somebody being a threat if you're just patrolling to make sure kids don't get hurt in school why is your gun unclipped um stuff like when they slam their girl out, out in front of the um buffalo wild wings stuff like them putting the we are josh sign on the front of the uh downtown police station for a while and then restationing that officer back downtown not even a week after that and in the middle of all that you have fights going on like fights going on downtown which is leading the, poli the police department to station police officers on the corner of church and chapel street as if they're bouncers for a club every single day from seven to seven and the police chief being downtown and not driving properly and almost getting me hit <laughs> so i mean what I, what i've been doing is kind of sort of the unconventional way of sort of inspecting and researching the problem and also helping kids understand hey listen if you're afraid of me nine times out of ten, it's because of what society programmed into you. Because in a lot of cases, I realize I've had five year olds walk up to me, ten year olds walk up to me, hi, I'm so and so, what's your name? And the parents like, no, 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 don't say hi to him. <laughs> Stranger danger, don't do it. And it's just like, so why is the adult scared and the kid not? Because up, because I haven't done nothing. I'm, I'm not. I don't have like blood coming off my mask and handing them out candy. I'm not doing all of that. I'm just walking on the street. If they want to say hi, they say hi. But um. In a nutshell, that's that's what I do. I I, I provoke people, <laughs> <laughs> and I hope people understand. <laughs> Thanks for being an agitator. <laughs> uh, but thank you, though. That's why we needed that young voice at, at the table. Uh, just quickly before we get into, and we don't have much time. But first, let me just say this: the, pro the workshop that preceded us. Could have really gone on for another hour, don't y'all think? <laughs> yeah, they, we were just sitting back there, Gary and I were like, ooh. But, um, but we, like, we appreciate the, the, the comments and, and the uh, challenges you presented. Just quickly, I did mention, I mentioned Stacy, Stacy Spell. Stacy, raise your hand, people need to know who you are. Stacy runs Project Longevity, which is an, an entity that basically is, is federally and state funded to try to, that, that attempts gang intervention and tries to get those young men and women who are on the threshold of being recruited in, in the gang life in New Haven and try to give them options, provide options for them to, to that lifestyle. Give them alternatives, give them options, give them, give, them, give them something else to think about and to do. And this is a challenge resource where we like to commend to Stacey for the work that he's doing. Thank you, Stacey. And also, uh, a lot of folks in this room, especially on this panel, always a diss in Yale. <laughs> I was I'm underwear at Yale, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it is what it is. But I wanted to acknowledge Mike Moran. Where is Mike? Is Mike still here? Right. Yeah, he might left, but well, acknowledge him anyway. Because Mike Moran represents the best of what Yale has to offer, we think. He's been long active and concerned and committed to this community. So I want to acknowledge him, even in, in absentia. Mike Moran from Yale University. Thank you, Mike, for what you do. <laughs> and finally related, and I think this serves as a segue to the discussion we're about to begin. Bobby Johnson, stand up. Bobby Johnson and his lawyer, Ken Rosenthal. Where's Ken? Ken and Bobby. Bobby Johnson served nine years on wrongfully in Connecticut prison, was released just last week, about a week ago, yes? And, and we, we met and we talked and we trying to do our best to help this young man re reintegrate into society and this community. So give him a hand and, and help him out. And his lawyer, Ken Rosenthal. Ken? Yeah. So, so I'm sure Bobby and Ken appreciate that, that, that applause, but he also wants you to extend the hand, extend the hand as well. So he'll be around afterwards. You want to talk to him about some of his needs and concerns and challenges that he may have. Thank you. All right, first question, because I know we have a lot of time. Let me get to this. Given historic pre and present day structural inequalities that exist in America, given police misconduct, domestic terrorism, i.e. Charleston, and fratricide in the African-American and Latino communities panel. 
What does the phrase Black Lives Matter mean to you? We're gonna start with Barbara. <laughs> That's all you go ahead, go ahead. I hate going first. How did he pick me? But anyway, that one's easy for me. Um, Black Lives Matter um, means to me white lives have always mattered because a lot of people think, well, white lives matter. Well, white lives have always mattered. With the uh, foundation of white supremacy that told you that your life mattered and the doctrine of black inferiority told us our lives didn't matter. So that's easy for me. This is a time that we're saying we've had enough of being devalued, being invisible, being assaulted, and just totally ignored. We're tired, and this is why we're standing up today and we're saying, you know what? No more that our lives don't matter. We want everybody to know that black lives matter. When we see our kids gunned down in the street every day, when we see the high unemployment, our kids being shuffled in a school system that doesn't educate them, that builds up a, a pathway to prison, when we see moms and dads taken out of our homes and then our kids are left alone to, on the streets to take care of themselves, and when we see that so many of our black men are in prison and we have the audacity to say, where are the black fathers? That's why we need to, we need to make it clear, black lives matter. That's what it means to me. Thank you, brother. That's why you called on you first. Asia? I don't want to go after her, no. That's why they called on her first. No, right. So, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, what it, what it means to me, everything that Barbara said. No, and, and Brown Lives Matter. And, and no, and um, what I would say is that when, I fir when it first came out, I was excited because somebody was taking a stance, finally, and saying it, and there was a movement nation nationally. And for me, I was thinking more of my own people because we have such a segregation within our, even the Latino community because we are of many, many colors. For instance, in my family, I'm, I'm the lightest one in my family. My father, my mom, they're both very dark and we're treated just like, just like black people are. And for me, Black Lives Matter means that we do matter, that it doesn't matter the skin color, that we should get the same opportunities like everybody else, and that we shouldn't be judged by the skin color that we, we hold dear. And that, honestly, why do we even have to say Black Lives Matter? Mm -hmm. We should automatically know that Black Lives Matter. That's what I think. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Um, the concept is, for me, is born out of the fact that, that America has engaged historically for hundreds of years in dehumanizing, that America has engaged for hundreds of years in dehumanizing anybody that, that had a darker, a darker hue than that that we call white, uh, or people who had more melanin than those who didn't. And as a result of that, we then live our lives in contrast. And so for me growing up in the South, it was, I lived in a black community and we knew where the boundaries were in terms of white communities. When you go into a hotel, you see black people who pick up the bags and black people who clean the rooms and white people who, who, who deal with the money, and white people who call the shots, when you actually look at <clears throat> other areas of our, our, our culture, we compare everything within the context of not black and brown, but black and white. One has a pejorative nature and the other has a negative nature. And so we forgot that humanity is supposed to matter, irrespective of what our hue or our melanin mixture is. And so we delve out resources based on that and then we blame those who we've given fewer resources to and decide that for some reason they have been shiftless and lazy because it's in their innate ability and therefore we treat them different. And so black folk, this particular generation of black folk, because we had a generation of black folk who said no more, 
60, 70. And then we went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then a new generation of children who played the game, whose parents played the game. And they were supposed to slip through the, the needle point of prosperity and ignore those of their kin who left behind. And this group said, even though we go to the best schools and we sit next to white people, we get treated just like our grandparents used to get treated. And we ain't taking it no more. So that's what it means to me when I hear young people say, and old people got a, a sort of gobble on top, that we matter, irrespective of our color. We're as smart as we actually have been. In fact, my son said to me, I don't really want to go to a black college, because I went to a black college. And I said, why? He said, Dad, you brought me up in a community that is one of the most racially diverse communities in America. I want to go to school in an environment where I could actually participate. And he, too, has learned that in order to get the same difference, he's going to have to work three times harder in the way that I was taught. Mm -hmm. And so they realize that there is no fairness in racism. There's no fairness in this dual culture that we say we put down when we do away with Jim Crow and we do away with racism, but we actually hold on to it in de facto in everything that we do. And it only can last if you become complicit with it mm -hmm. on both sides. And so my life matter, and a friend of mine, a white female, asked me after the shooting in South Carolina, what are you most afraid of? And I says, a black man leaving my house every day. No matter how much education and how well I try to do, I can walk out my house and get gunned down for no reason by police. And see, I remember a time when the black police couldn't even arrest white people. Mm. So I've seen a lot. And so, so that's what it means to me. I'm sorry for going on, but it's, this, is, this is about Clifton said, I dedicated my life to creating change an opportunity. But we do that through transformation, not just change, because we change our minds every day in this culture. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just because before we hear from Senator, Senator Holder Whit Whitfield, I um, admit it and I apologize. But State Representative Robin Porter. Is Robin here? Where's Robin? Yes, Robin Porter. Please give her a hand, please. She <laughs> does a great job for our community. And truly, she fits, she fits the, the, the mantra of activist, advocate, and agitator as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robin, for what you do. Send the, send the hold of Winfield. Mm -hmm. So when we um, lay out that term, Black Lives Matter, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not 100% sure. I, I know I have feelings about what I want it to be. Um, but I think it has a lot to do with what um, the young people make it. The young ladies back there with the Black Lives Matter shirt, um, Sabir, uh, the younger people who are um, connected to this movement in ways that as much of an activist as I am, I am not. It has a lot to do with what they make it. You know, there are a lot of people who are asserting that Black Lives Matter is on Facebook uh, to their friends, uh, but having done the kind of work that some of us have done for a long time, uh, I know how hard it is to continue that work. And I guess my, my thinking about Black Lives Matter is, are you prepared to actually do the work long term um, that becomes very difficult the longer you do it? Okay. I'll tell you a quick story. I remember um, you know, some of the work we've done uh, has to do with people who are doing some things on the street. And I remember one fall day I left my house. And these things just hit you sometimes. Uh, and I'm not even talking about white supremacy right now. I'm just talking about being in the work. Uh, and I left my house and I get in my car and it's like seven in the morning and I'm going down the street and I see these guys at the corner store at seven o'clock. The store is not open. They're already doing what they do. Uh, and these are guys who I push back against other people all the time uh, saying some things about them. But that morning is just one of those things that hit me. And I said to myself, why am I spending my life doing this? Right. That's the kind of thing that you deal with before you deal with those other things, white supremacy, uh, the system that doesn't want to listen to you and all of those things. And what I'm trying to get young people to understand is you don't have to listen to what I say, but this is some hard, long term work. You're not going to upend a system of white supremacy uh, by simply asserting that black lives matter. Right. There's some things that you're going to have to do that are tough. 
and there are going to be days where you're going to look at yourself just like I've looked at myself. I can't even count the number of times to say, why am I doing this work? There are other things I could be doing that are easier. And so I hope that Black Lives Matter means that they're going to assert themselves in ways that are going to push on the system, that they're going to insert themselves like I have into the system, some of them, not all of them, because you need people, you need to spook the sap by the door, right? Mm -hmm. You need those people. So that's what I think of when I think of Black Lives Matter. Thank you. So be it. I got interesting stories about Black Lives Matter. Um, Black Lives Matter to me means that it's basically like Barbara was saying that white lives have always mattered, black, and we have to understand that black lives matter. Um, in this city, do, doing what I do the way that I do it, I often feel like a lot of what makes people uncomfortable is the fact that I am black. I say this because pulled over 28 times a year, not just in New Haven, New Haven, West Haven, North Haven, um, Southern Connecticut State Police, Yale Campus Police, Hamden, Woodbridge, Woodbridge cops come into my, came into my job first three weeks of me being there because um, 911 calls. I left five minutes away from my job. I get five 911 calls on my way to my job. Um, and the biggest, and honestly, out of all the cops that I've dealt with, the ones that give me the most problem I'm sorry, are the ones that know who I am already. Because I've done this for two years now. I've been doing this since 2000, and was it 15 now? Do it, been doing this since July of 2013, right? And my father is a sergeant in the city. Uh, I'm, I, I promise you I'm not doing this because I'm uncomfortable. I'm doing it to make a point. Um, my father's a sergeant in the city. He's been a, he's been a police officer in the city for about 19 years. Um, Cops know who I am. I have no problem with while I have the mask on, walking up to them and saying, "Hey, by the way, I'm I'm a mask maniac, but you can call me Sabir on first name basis, and we can understand." And I've had cops pull me over, and literally, they've pulled me over like I've, I've never seen this. Why are cops pulling like you know how you know how when you get pulled over on the highway because you're going like 70 and 60 mile per hour on speed limit? Mm. How, how do I get lights and sirens and two cop cars when I get pulled over and I'm on a bicycle? I don't understand that. <laughs> But that has happened, and a cop, and, and and I've had at least three cops in the last year go. I know who you are. I know who your father is, and I know you know the police commissioner. But you're still getting pulled over. But after the whole situation is done, I get no ticket. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and it's not even like, and I, and and, and they don't even try to slip it in there. Free to, um, you, you, you're, you're, you're doing a breach of peace. People are scared. They didn't even slip that in there. It is, why you wear the mask? Ask me a billion on questions. And the entire time, I'm like this. <laughs> and especially when I started working at Woodbridge, I transferred. I used to work at Starbucks on Church and Chapel downtown. I've worked in f four or five different Starbucks. And basically, any Starbucks that can drive Disney from New Haven, I've worked in. And working at Woodbridge and, and trans going to different cities to work, you start noticing how different cities are set up and how the police officers police differently. Mm -hmm. Go to Woodbridge. I remember, I want to say my third week I worked in Woodbridge. I started going back to dressing like this when I go to work. I serve coffee. That's it. And I'm not even like a supervisor. I just, I'm at the bottom. I just, all I do is make, make your coffee. Mm -hmm. And no lie, the cops come in and they go, yeah, we got five nine one calls about somebody wearing a mask coming into the store. Why? I don't know. My my bike is parked 20 feet from the store. I take the mask off when I get off the bike. I can assure you I am the only African American who walks into Starbucks in Woodbridge. I'm the only one that works there. <laughs> okay? They walk in, they see me, I have glasses on, okay? And they go, that was you? And I'm like, yeah, and then my supervisor asked me, why, you wear why do you wear glasses to work when you have 20-20 vision? I look at them and I go, how many black men do you see with mug shots with glasses on? Glasses make you look less threatening, duh. This is why, I can't, this is why you can't put all your bass in your voice when, you want, when you're on the drive-thru and you say, hello, welcome to Starbucks. And they're just like, oh, you're black, for real? And it's just like, it's the subliminal stuff. I've had issues with people having an issue with the mask guy being black. Why do we even have an issue with that? So it's just like, 
Black Lives Matter, the way I think about it is, and and, 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 I, and I let people know this all the time, and it's, I, I, I'm, you know, a lot of y'all might dislike me for saying this, but Black Lives Matter to me ultimately is helping people understand that in America, being light-skinned or being Caucasian is not the only race that you could do whatever you want to do and harness your freedom of speech and your free will in this country. Amen. That should not matter. Whatever race you whatever race you are, whatever you do, being a person living in America, you have all the civil rights the next person has. And as long as you are not committing a crime, you should not be treated as if you are committing a crime. Thanks, Abu. Um, it's time is fleeting, so what we're going to do is this. On, on, this is one last question. I want to at least get some comment coming on. I think, I think we have enough time for t two minutes apiece, max, for, for everybody. <laughs> but it, but it's, and I apologize for that, but, but here we are. Just, just quickly, uh, Michelle Alexander in her classic, uh, The New Jim Crow, uh, writes this. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways that was once legal to discriminate against all African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, the old forms of discrimination, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote, denial of educational opportunity, denial of food stamps and other public benefits, and exclusion from jury service are suddenly legal in many states, but not Connecticut, just by the way. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights and arguably, arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. Please, Amy, why don't you take that first, please? It's two, two minutes away. It was for you, Amos, but I can go if you're not ready. <laughs> so, no, because I'm ready. I'm ready to talk about it. Listen, you know, I, I, those, those individuals who have been in a system uh, don't have people advocating for them for the most part. You know, people in positions like mine at the legislature, you, you don't want to touch them, right? You know, I, I have a label as why is everything you deal with criminals? Now, that's by far not the case, but that's what people recognize me for having worked on since I uh, endeavored to be in the legislature. Uh, and it is not an easy path to go when you're trying to deal with that. But, you know, how do you, how do you have a community where you have the numbers you're talking about, where you have 25 people a week, 25 or so people a week coming back into the community uh, who were in the system? That is an impact on the community. Um, you have to have people who are ready to stand up and say, look, if we're talking about black lives matter, what we do to black people matters. Uh, and what we have done uh, with the system that we have is created a system where you have those 25 people coming back. Uh, and so you have to deal with all of that. But you know, one of the, the things I want, I want to make sure that we're talking about is not just what has happened to them because they're in the system, but how they got in that system. So they got into that system, right? We talk about a second chance society. That's what the governor talked about. That's wonderful. But we have not dealt with the fact that they didn't have a, they didn't really truly have a first chance, right? They live in compressed communities without economic opportunity. They live in communities where uh, if you wanted to go and get a job, you can't really easily do that because you don't have transportation systems. And all of the things that we don't really talk about when we talk about people in the prison system, because what we're talking about are the experiences in the prison system. But those experiences began way before they were in that prison system. And so if we're ever actually going to deal with it, we've got to get people, again, into, the, into not just the spaces where they are dealing when they come out on the reentry end, but dealing with what happens to these young people uh, before they get in. Listen, in this state, we talked about uh, the school to prison pipeline. Uh, we, have tried, we tried for about five years to get an MOU bill passed here where there was a memorandum of understanding between the police who are in the schools, and I, I disagree with a lot of people. I don't believe they really belong in our schools, but they're there. Uh, we tried to get a memorandum of understanding bill passed where they would have an understanding with them in the school how this works in terms of discipline. Uh, that was fought against. It was fought against by people who wanted to keep that system in place. Right. This is. Not th let me make sure you understand. You can tell me when to cut off. Right. Let me make sure you understand. Seconds, right. Okay. <laughs> this is. Look, this is. This is what we're talking about here. We're talking about police. This is what you can arrest people for. At school, this is what you discipline people for. Because if you don't have a bright line between them, your kids wind up in jail. We didn't have people from the communities affected coming to advocate, and the people who are in the space where they can help weren't doing a darn thing to change that system. As a matter of fact, they were pushing against the change in the system. 
right? This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Black Lives Matter. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about systems, because those systems in place, the politics that nobody cares about because it doesn't affect their lives, affects every single one of our lives. So. Thank you, Senator. Let, let, let me, uh, uh, I, I don't seldom, I don't seldom get caught not being able to respond right away. <laughs> but I was still processing what Sabia had to say. See, one of the challenges that I have, because I also have a little dyslexia, is processing. And it takes me a while when we're talking about serious stuff. It's hard for me to run from one place to the other. Because as I was hearing uh, Clifton's question, I was looking at Ken move. And what it said to me was that Ken Harris works with poor pregnant women who have terrible birth outcomes because they're poor and black. And then I was thinking about the question of Jim Crow that he asked and thinking about prison. And one of the things I thought about <coughs> was that if we only deal with the second chance issues, which everybody in this community gets excited about, mm -hmm. then we mm -hmm. fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. We ought to be concerned about why kids are going to prison. That's right. And really do something about that. That's that's the Jim Crow ness of the prison system. It's the people that can are trying to nurse to a health to have a healthy baby, only to set that kid up to go to prison. And somebody else is Somebody else ought to stand up and say, no more with our children. Mm -hmm. And so inside, and we won't have time to talk about this, but inside the Fresh Start Fault Leadership is a piece that says, we believe in something called family retreat. Because of the trauma associated with leave being snatched out of your home, remember that's how it started, disappearing from your home. And a, and a family has smaller children in that home, younger teenagers, brothers and sisters, whose, whose older sibling goes to jail, we should have a dispatch to that family so that we can actually retreat around that family, make certain that those younger children realize that there's another pathway for them. Remember, my question was, can I get out if all I see is black men going to the military and coming back in caskets and black men going to jail and coming back and having their lives stamped out for the rest of their life. There's got to be another way. So if we as a community deal only with the second chance, which nobody really wants to give people, I just hired a woman who made a mistake in another town, smart as a whip. And at the end of the article, the reporter says she was, she was elected into the to the Boys and Girls Hall of Fame, and she was also nominated by the Business Journal in Hartford, the young person to see in the state. I hired her. She had never been arrested, convicted, uh, indicted, and they wrote an article that was a repeat of four articles they had already written, simply because I hired her. Mm -hmm. She'd never been to jail. And so this was a woman of color. This was a woman of color. and so I. I say this, when I was a kid all through school, and especially in college, if I'd written the same paper and gave it to the teacher <laughs> over and over again, they said, no, Smith, you got to get up out of here. <laughs> Why is it that we allow reporters to write the same story in the same way, detailing the same information with nothing new? The only thing new in the story was that I hired her. <laughs> it was a story about shame. So that then, the, and then they went to my funder and said, she's managing money under the leadership and then told a story about how we turned the organization around. My point is, see, if people can't get a first chance, which is when they're growing up, Senator, Senator uh, Holder Winfield said, and nobody wants to give them a second chance and they've never been convicted. And this woman was really getting a second chance. She had never been to prison. Ladies How and do gentlemen, we ever deal with this? Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. just a small administrative housekeeping matter. Um, the Yale Art Gallery closes at 5. five. We all have a, 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 a side entrance that we can use to exit. But if anyone here needs to use the wheelchair accessible front entrance or has a package, 
in a locker out front. I would ask you to head out now because that we will not have access to that part of the gallery. So again, if you have, if you packed your uh, a bag in one of the lockers, or if you need to use the front entrance, uh, this would al allow you the time to get there. Um, we will be needing to wrap up the panel fairly soon. I encourage all of you to join us at ArtSpace afterwards, where we have, we'll have time for questions with all the panelists. Thank you. All right, that being said, since Amos and the Senator took up all the time, Barbara. Uh, <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, Ken Harris, raise your hand. Ken Harris, probably healthy stuff. Thank you, Ken, for being here. He does a great job <laughs> with trying to address health issues in this community. Barbara, and Keisha, and then Sabir. One, one, one minute, please. I, I, I can't even open my mouth in a minute. I, I know, I know Barbara. <laughs> Yes, you can. Anyway, we don't have enough. We will never have enough time. If he gave me 20 minutes, I wouldn't have enough time to talk about um, um, what this Jim Crow has done for us. So, and, and, and the, the quickest way that I can say it is when the Africans were brought here, they had a purpose. When that purpose was no more, they built a system that said, we, this is what we're gonna do with the surplus people. We abolished slavery. We Then we go, oh, wait a minute, we gotta go back and amend it. So what are we gonna do with all these surplus people? Add in an amendment that says they're still enslaved, legally enslaved, as long as we can get them in prison. So now what do we do? All the things that was normal behavior, we criminalize it. We do the same thing with our kids. When I was growing up, we fought and we had all of these things. We disobeyed teachers. We went to the principal's office, got a call home. Nobody went to jail. This system was built to do exactly what it's doing. And I get so upset when I hear legislators saying, oh, these are unintended consequences. Well, you know hell that you I, I just get so upset, I can't even talk. You know good and darn well that, these, that what you did was intended, and this is what's going on in our system. And I got to go, because I know we only got a minute, but Lord, if I had time. I know that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Patience. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> so what I would say is that we have to first stop arresting kids, is what we have to do. We wouldn't need a second chance later. We do need to help them correct their behavior and learn to make up for their mistakes because we all aren't perfect. I still make mistakes today. So my issue is that we're arresting kids for behaviors that are developmentally normal. That's where the issue first starts in the school system. So my suggestion is each of us as adults, whether we have children in the school system or you have family members with children in the school system, pay attention go to their school, find out what's going on. How are those adults handling behaviors in those schools? Because trust me, they know my name in the school system. Mm -hmm. For all kids, I stand up and I agitate. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. <laughs> so be it. <laughs> um, let, me, let me first start off by saying that. One minute. <laughs> I, I know, I know. You know, you know, this is the first time I actually got a one minute card ever. But yeah, so basically let me start off by saying that I think the voting limitation for felons, first of all, is probably one of the dumbest things that we invented in America. Honestly, why are you why are you limiting voting for felons? What? So and then two, it's like once someone does, in my opinion, once someone does their time, they sh they shouldn't have as many they shouldn't have the limitations they have when they come out. They shouldn't, because if someone because think about it, if somebody went to, if if somebody went to jail, for say let's say let's say ten years for drug dealing. Right, and you don't hire them. That person who was a drug dealer obviously was good with money. Duh. That's why. That's why they got caught because <laughs> they were selling so much. And you're just saying, "Oh, they're a drug dealer. We're not going to do it." And to, to put it in simpler terms, think about it like this: When you was a kid and you got put on timeout, did they hold that timeout over you for like the next 20 years? Did they say you can't go outside for the next 20 years because you 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 didn't come in the house when you wasn't when you were supposed to? Like, just it's simple stuff like that. And, and I do agree with um, what Kaisha said. It's like, we, we need to stop criminalizing kids. Mm -hmm. We have to stop doing it. I work with kids who are the same age as, that I am with a ninth grade education in the city, and they can score the same level on the SAT as any, as any one of these kids who are in 12th grade or graduated or valedictorian because this system is designed to teach and not to educate kids. Right. 
And if we don't start doing that, we're just going to keep on going in the same circle we've been going in for since forever, since the beginning of this country, especially when it comes to minorities and people of color. All right. Thank you, Sabir. Let me, uh, we, we just don't have enough time, y'all. Sure don't. We just don't have enough time. But we want to thank, <laughs> thank you for this time. Let's give the organizers another hand of, a round of applause. Thank you. Um, keep clapping for Sabir, for Barbara, for Amos, for Gaisha, and some of the, the hold of Winfield. They, there is a reception following down at the art space, right? On the Cap Chapel. I mean, I'm sorry. Crown and. Yeah. Orange. 50 orange. 50 orange. Yeah, come on down. And uh, thank you. And again, we end as we begin. Be the change that you seek. Be the change that you seek. Be the change that you seek. Thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Continue to struggle. Thank you. I just want to add a little note. I know I'm never doing what I'm supposed to do, but I just want people to know that after they incarcerate you, they will charge you for your incarceration when you get out. So this system is, mm. <laughs>